I'm glad to see you back. We are uh, progressing with the book of Revelation, and uh, tonight we are taking a look at probably the most difficult section of the book of Revelation. We have already looked at uh, sections 1 and 2. Section 1, this section here, was the section of the seven churches. We laid out the history of Christianity in seven phases, seven periods. Then we spoke about the seven seals, and we spoke about the fact that the seven seals run side by side with the seven churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new episode of uh, our immersion experience. May your spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. The seven trumpets. I don't have seven trumpets. I only have two. These are the trumpets that are called in the Bible shofar, or shofar. This is probably the horn of a ram. And this one seems to be coming from something much bigger. And the sound of this is pretty strong. So this was the sound. And here we are tonight in this section, section three. And if you look at this layout, then you have the seven trumpets which obviously parallel the seven churches, the seven seals, but also the seven bowls on the other side of the chiasm. You may remember that the introductory vision always has to do with the sanctuary. And tonight again, we have a sanctuary introductory, introductory vision. As you can see there, Jesus, the lion, and the lamb, has in his hands something. Something that I also have here. It is pretty small. What is this? A sensor. And this is what you get when you look at a beautiful picture online and then you order something on Amazon, <laughs> and by the time it gets here, it shrinks and uh, becomes this big. Well, it still helps to understand what is going on. Eight, five, okay, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, from this altar now, because he came from that altar to this altar, he presented incense here, and then threw it to the earth. <laughs> and there were noises, thunderings, lightings, and earthquake. Now this process is a very interesting process. You will not find in the Bible in many details this whole move. But there is a Jewish writing called the Mishnah that describes in many details what the process was in the Tamid. The Tamid was the daily sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, that's what the priest would do. The priest would come to the altar of sacrifice. At the altar, he would be given incense. What does this altar represent? The altar of sacrifices. 
What does it represent? Death of Jesus, more precisely, the cross. What does the cross provide which can hold, so to speak, the prayers of the saints to be presented in front of the throne? What is to be mixed, if you want, with the prayers of the saints so it can be presented in front of God? The death or the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we say the merits of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense now? Okay, so Jesus does something here at the altar that together with the prayers of the saints, is taken inside here. It is presented in front of the throne. Then fire is put in the censer. The priest comes out. Again, the people are praying in the courtyard. And he throws. Let me show you how he throws it. <laughs> <laughs> he throws it. Fire is being thrown on earth. And you can find that symbol in multiple places in the Bible. Fire being thrown on earth means judgment or divine justice. So here we are dealing with a scene in which divine justice is being served. Question is, to whom? Because after this introductory vision, the seven angels start blowing their trumpets. So now we know it's a justice kind of thing happening here. We see what the context is. The context is the cross, the merits of Jesus Christ. The saints are praying for something. They're asking for something. The prayers of the saints mixed with the merits of Jesus Christ are taken inside here. And as a result, justice, divine justice, is manifested. And then the seven trumpets start sounding. What is the trumpet about? Numbers chapter 10, verse 9 is one of the verses. There are multiple verses that pretty clearly outline what the meaning of the trumpets is. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you. So this is for a scenario in which you are attacked. It's not you attacking. You are being attacked. You go against an enemy who oppresses you. Then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. And you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. So the context here is some sort of conflict, some sort of war between God's people and the enemies of God's people. Remember, the seven seals outline the history of God's people. God's people throughout the centuries from the time of the cross to the second coming, go through all kind of challenging situations. One of the main realities that kick in qu quite early in the second period, the period of Smyrna, is persecution. God's people is being persecuted. And that is happening throughout the centuries all the way down. And we will see later that the history of Christianity will culminate, so to speak, with fierce persecution again. So throughout the history of Christianity, we have this fight, this battle between God's people and the enemy of God's people. What we have in the seven trumpets, actually, is the trumpet being blown asking for divine justice to be manifested as God's people is going through the hardships caused or oppression caused by the enemies of God's people. So that's the story of the seven 
trumpets. The seven seals is the history of God's people. The seven trumpets is the history of the enemies of God's people. And now we can move to the seven trumpets. I will not go into detail because we don't have time for that. We are going through the story so we can get the big picture. But what we want to see for sure is uh, how these seven trumpets really outline the history of the enemies of God's people, how God intervenes, does justice, but not justice without mercy. Because throughout the history of Christianity, divine justice is still mixed with mercy. There is another section of the book of Revelation, the seven plagues, which parallel the seven trumpets. And in the seven plagues, there is no mercy. Justice is being poured out unmixed. That's the term. Here, there is still mercy. That's why the incense is in picture. Because mercy is still happening. And you will see later that the gospel is still being preached as well. Whereas in the seven plagues, there is no need for the preaching of the gospel. Why? Because mercy is not available at that time. So here we are dealing with divine justice. I can call it preliminary justice. But let's go to the seven trumpets. The first angel sounded and hail and fire. Hail and fire is justice in the Bible. Followed mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up. You know what trees symbolize in the Bible? Let me just give you a hint. Jesus says, tree. What will they do to the dry tree? What was he speaking about? The green tree was him. Who was the dry tree? people of Israel. So a third of the trees. Now, please also understand that in the Bible, one third is always the portion of the enemy. One very strong evidence is Revelation 12, where one third of uh, the angels or the stars of heaven follow the dragon or are dragged by the dragon. But again, we move on with the story. So this picture here, the first, is about the first group that persecuted God's people. You know who the first persecutors of God's people were? It was the Jewish nation. Not the Jewish nation in a very general sense, but the leadership, the representatives of the nation. Then, who was the second big persecutor of God's people. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. The mountain falling in the Bible is a symbol for Babylon. And what is the New Testament Babylon? It's Rome. Then the third angel, a great star, fell from heaven. Who's the star falling from heaven? Lucifer, Lucifer correct. That's the devil himself. But you know that uh, there are pictures in the Bible and in the book of Revelation, the beast acts out practically the same thing that the dragon does. So somebody seems to be in view here, a great star falling from heaven. And the name of the star is Wormwood. In the Bible, Wormwood, among other things, also represents false doctrine or apostasy. So who was the third group of big persecutors of Christians after the Jews and the Romans? Christians. Christians, that's true. And uh, then you have the fourth angel that 
sounds and a third of the sun is struck, the moon, the stars, so darkness is installed. And we have darkness in Christianity. We have seen darkness in the seals as well. And there is darkness as well in the churches. So after the four first four trumpets, we have three others you have there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So these here are the whoa, whoa, whoa. Up to this point, we don't have the whoa, whoa, whoa. Here the whoa, whoa, whoa starts. What does that say? World Wide Web. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it means that something really bad is happening from this point on. Well, let's look at the description. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star that had fallen. So it's not a star falling at that point. It's a star that had fallen. Have we seen the star falling before? In the third trumpet, right? So. Here John sees the star that had fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit? Well, the bottomless pit in the Bible is the residency of the devil and his cohorts. Don't send us into the bottomless pit. The devils prayed to Jesus. So we have the bottomless pit. Pit, we have uh, the star, the fallen star, and we know the fallen star is Satan primarily, then masqueraded by something else or somebody else. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Can you imagine smoke <laughs> coming out from a bottomless pit? But when he looks, he sees the sun and uh, the air were darkened. Again, darkness, darkness that had been installed already in the previous trumpet, because the sun, the moon, and the stars were hit in the previous trumpet. Here, darkness comes even bigger because of the smoke of the pit. But what is the smoke of the pit? Because out of the smoke, Locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So it almost looks like when you look carefully at the smoke coming out from the bottomless pit where the devil himself is and his cohorts, it's not smoke, it's locusts that come out. And they do something like scorpions. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Who suffers because of this invasion of the demonic forces? God's people? No. The enemies of God's people. Not those that have the seal of God, those that do not have the seal of God. So what we know up to this point is some sort of demonic invasion. They had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, who's that? Whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon, English destroyer. So this is an invasion of demonic forces led by the devil himself. Remember, to him or to the angel of the bottomless pit was given the key of the bottomless pit. When in the Bible you read was given, and it's not indicated who does it, who gives it, who gives it, actually. 
God gives it. So there is a situation here, or starting from here, when God kind of gives over one third, that is, the segment of the devil, to the torture or to the invasion, the attack of the enemy himself. Then the sixth angel sounded, yeah, because the first woe is past. Two more woes are coming. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates in the Bible is always the border between God's people and the enemy of God's people. And in some pictures, God tells his people, hey, guys, if you don't change your attitude, I will send the river Euphrates against you. Or the river Euphrates would uh, get out from between its banks and would flood you, overflow. Right? So uh, there are some angels bound at the great river Euphrates that are released. So again, we have the demonic forces empowered by God to invade, to install darkness. And then we have the forces of the enemies of God's people released from the river Euphrates. So then, we have here the forces of the enemies that seem to be human forces here released from the river Euphrates. They are released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard a number of them. Have we heard this expression somewhere else? I heard the number of them. Okay, so this number, the 200 million, seems to be in opposition to the other number that John heard about, the 144,000. If you look at the numbers, there's a huge difference between the two hosts. Okay? And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, yacinth, blue, and uh, surfer yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. These are all descriptions taken from the Old Testament about the enemy of God's people when they invade. There are quite many descriptions in the Old Testament that use this kind of language. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, and here the same rest can be translated as the remnant of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. In other words, there are two kinds of remnants. The remnant of God, and you have the remnant of the enemy as well. They did not repent. Those that were not killed, they did not repent of the works of their hands. Again, repentance is still possible. That's why I emphasized incense. When incense is not available, repentance is not possible. But here, repentance is still possible. That's why I say that justice is still mixed with mercy. And they did not repent, again in verse 21, of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or their theft. Let's recap what we had up to this point. We had the first four seals last time, and the first four seals were very similar. Horses, four horses. They were similar. 
after the first four seals, the picture changed somewhat. You didn't have horses, you had some other things. Similarly, here in the trumpets, you have the first four trumpets, somewhat similar, but then from five on, it's different. It's the same picture that I put here. From five on, the whoa starts, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. So it's different. So you have a group of four, then you have a group of three. But between the sixth and the seventh, here, you had like a parenthesis of the ceiling. You remember the angel that came with a seal of God, and uh, somebody was telling the winds at the four corners of the, of the earth not to release the wind yet until the ceiling is done. Similarly here, between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, we have this parenthesis about witnessing. Why is this important? It is important so that we can see that indeed the seven seals and the seven trumpets are parallel. So in the seven seals we saw the history of God's people. In the seven trumpets we are seeing the history of the enemies of God's people. But right here, in between the two final phases of the history of Christianity, we have chapters 10 and 11. And uh, let's see what it entails. I saw still another mighty angel. So we had the seven angels with the trumpets. Then we had one angel with the censer. This is still another mighty angel. Coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow was on his head. His face was like sun, his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion rose. Please imagine the picture. An angel that appears like this, one foot on the land, one on the sea. What does that represent? Who's in charge here? Who's in control here, right? He is, he is in control. And this angel, if you look carefully, is described in a language in which Christ is usually described. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now, other translations say there should be time no longer. In uh, Greek, in the Greek language, there are two words for time. There is time that is like this, a period of time. And there is time like a point, which is just a moment in time. One is uh, kairos. The other one is chronos. Which word is here? Chronos. Okay, interesting. So, in other words, there is no more chronos, no more time period. What is this about? In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, the angel tells Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And then, verses 6 and 7, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Is the question. How long? 
the angel Gabriel there held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven. Both hands are lifted. And swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. So it gives a period of time. What is interesting is that you can see the same picture here in the book of Revelation. In the book of Daniel, the question is, how long? And the answer is, for a time, times, and half a time. In the book of Revelation, the same question is asked in chapter 6. In the fifth seal, remember the souls under the altar. We spoke about them last time. How long, O Lord? And the answer comes, in the same time frame, practically, or the next time frame because that's the fifth seal there and here is the sixth trumpet the answer to how long is there will be no longer chronos no longer time period but only in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel when he is about to sound the mystery of God would be finished as he declares to his servants the prophets let me try to paint it a little bit so we can get the picture. In Daniel, the question is how long? And the answer is time, times, and half of time. Give me this time period in years. 1260. And in months, 42. Correct. So. It says, the angel says to Daniel that what he has to seal, what he has to hide, so to speak, will take this time period. So here is the time of uh, 42 slash 1 to 60. Okay? When John sees the angel. John's angel only has one hand lifted up. Do you know why only one hand is lifted up? Because in the other one is the scroll. So this is angel one. This is angel two. And the angel two, angel two says there will be no more chronos. What chronos? No more time period. What is the time period that the book of Daniel that was sealed was speaking about? The time period that Daniel was so disturbed about. And he was trying to understand. And he couldn't. Exactly. A 20 300 days. So that means that this thing here is the end of the 2300 days. That's when angel 2 appears and says there will be no more time. But when the angel appears, it's not then that he opens the book. The book is already open. Have you noticed that? When the angel appears, the book is open already. You know why? Because the book is open here. So angel 2, open book. And angel 2, oath. Let me move on with the story. The voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again said, and said, go take the little book which is open. So the little book from the angel's hand. In the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And that's what he did. He took the book, ate it, 
it became sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach. Now this is an Old Testament picture again. You can look at Ezekiel chapter 3. And the significance of this is when you take the message, you enjoy it. You're happy about it. But then when you are going to preach it, and you will have to face again persecution, it will become bitter to you. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about or concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Here John plays an active role in the whole picture. He is involved in the scenario. And he experiences whatever happens in history when these things are fulfilled. So here we are. This is where the angel tells John, take the book, this book that was open here, take and eat it. He takes it, eats it. It becomes bitter in his stomach, although in his mouth it was sweet. And then he is told, you have to go on prophesying. Problem is, from here on, we don't know how long it is. Because there's no prophetic time period established by God. It can take as long as it takes. It's like over time, there are some factors that play into that, but it is not established. Hey, this is what it has to take. So then, I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and uh, the angel stood, and the angel stood saying, "Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there." Uh, please imagine this. In uh, John's situation, when he eats the book, the scroll, the little scroll, he eats it. It becomes bitter in his stomach, and he. Uh, sits down in pain and the angel comes and says rise see the picture rise and measure the temple of God the altar and those who worship there I can't enter details here now but this is about the day of atonement obviously because these elements temple altar and worshipers plus one more the priests were only measured in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement. Why is the priest not measured here? The because the priest is Christ. So he doesn't need to be measured. But this is about the Day of Atonement obviously. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. It was given to the Gentiles. That's the right translation. And they will tread the holy city under foot for 42 months. 42 months. Huh. So this is a time period. So then, if here... We, we have the sixth. Please try to follow what I'm writing here. If here we have the sixth trumpet, and we are here in between the sixth and the seventh. So this is the seventh. Okay? Here we have the parentheses with the little book and with the measuring and the two witnesses that follow. The angel says that the outer court, the court outside the temple, should not be measured by John because it was given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city under foot for 42 months. So is the same time period here. So then, from here, Let's come a little backwards. What trumpet is here? Five, right? 
what trumpet is here? Four. And we go all the way backwards. Okay, let's just read on. And I will give power to my witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Again, the same thing. We are told that during this time, no matter how difficult it is, prophesying is going God, but the two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth. Why? Because it's a very difficult time. It is persecution and darkness while they still go on prophesying. When they finish, so when do they finish? Right here, at the end of the 42 months, their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. What was the trumpet that had to deal with the bottomless pit? The fifth, the fifth, the fifth. That's when the bottomless pit experience starts happening. Oh, so the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So this means that the fifth trumpet is actually here. Because in the fifth trumpet you have the bottomless pit and the invasion from the bottomless pit. And that's when the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit kills the two witnesses. So that means that we have to move this whole thing a little bit so that number five corresponds to this moment in history. Okay? The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God, or the Spirit of God, enters them, and they stand on their feet, and great fear falls on those who see them. Please keep in mind the word fear there, for a certain reason. Keep the word fear in mind. Okay? Have you noticed the language of the two witnesses? The two witnesses are killed... They are resurrected. Who was killed and then was resurrected? Okay. And then, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven. Who ascended to heaven? And uh, in a cloud. Again, that's very Christ-like, right? And their enemies saw them. So around this time here, they are killed, but soon after, they are resurrected, and then they are taken to heaven. You have two witnesses. But from that point on, instead of two witnesses, you have three witnesses. Which three witnesses? The three angels. Let me explain the imagery. In the Old Testament, in a courtroom setting, and here we have a courtroom setting, if the matter wasn't very critical, two witnesses would suffice. If something was critical, you needed not two, but three. So what we have here is the move from two witnesses to, to three witnesses. Why? Because it's becoming critical. Exactly. Now I ask you to keep fear in mind. 
for a reason. What reason? Look at this other verse, 13. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest, that is the remnant again, but this is the positive remnant, were what? Afraid and gave glory to whom? To the God of heaven. Tell me another place where the two words, fear and glory, appear together. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What? Saying with a loud voice, fear glory and give glory to him. So the remnant is identified by those two things, fear God and give him glory, because it's exactly the same time when practically from, from this year on, when the oath is made, roughly the same year on, the three angels go out and focus on fear of God and the glory of God. Then the seventh angel sounded. And what is the seventh angel about? We are all the way down here, right? What was here in the seventh church? I am at the door. Behold, I am at the door knocking, okay? What was here at the seventh seal? There was half an hour silence in heaven. The angels coming back with Jesus, emptying heaven, and uh, there's silence in heaven. And what do we have here? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and, the right translation is, started to reign. What moment is that? That's the moment when justice mixed with mercy is over, and from there, there's a short little period of time when justice, without being mixed with mercy, is poured out in the shape and form of the seven final plagues. And this is the story of the seven trumpets. Now, I know there's many, many questions. I have my questions as well. So please take, please take some uh, refreshment and uh, we are coming back for the Q&A in five minutes. So the question we want to start with is the question uh, in the fifth trumpet, can we see a picture of uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, some say the Turks and the Arabs, when those huge invasions happened, mainly in the Christian areas, are we dealing with those invasions here? I believe the text contains an element that kind of excludes that possibility as a unique application or exclusive application. And this is the element. But only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. These demonic forces, whoever they are, 
are not supposed to harm in any way God's people, God's children. They are allowed, empowered by God indeed, to only harm those that do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, those that do not belong to God. More than that, they are not supposed to kill. They only have the power of scorpions not to kill, only to torment. Now, when it comes to those invasions, Turks and Arabs, I believe both of these conditions are very disputable. I believe one of the best possible explanations with regard to the fifth seal, given that it has to do with the bottomless pit and forces coming out of the bottomless pit, the same pit from which the beast that kills the two witnesses, which represent in one way or another the preaching of the gospel, what killed the preaching of the gospel at one point historically in the history of Christianity was atheism. Atheism in the form of enlightenment, which the French Revolution was the exponent of. But I don't, I don't think it's limited to the French Revolution. But um, in any shape and form, atheism was the force that replaced or canceled out, killed the gospel. But soon after that, the gospel recovered. And after that huge blow that culminated in the French Revolution, we have this resurrection of the gospel. And when the Bible society started, and when the Advent movement also started to unfold and, and gain territory. So that's what I see in the text, uh, rather than limit it to some sort of um, human invasion. Here, it seems to be some demonic forces hard to be identified as humans, I believe. It's a very symbolic and uh, um, wide description of the devil himself leading an invasion against the gospel. And we have this time period where the witnesses witness in sackcloth. So the gospel is being preached, but under very difficult circumstances. And then when it's over, they are killed. But in a short time, they are resurrected they go up to heaven, and then instead of two witnesses, you have three witnesses which go parallel to what the angel tells John, you have to prophesy again. Yes. That's a good question. Look, why is it said don't harm the grass, the green stuff? If you go back to the first of the trumpets, you have similar imagery. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. There are Bible verses in which both the tree and the green grass is representation of God's people. In this case, only one third of those is affected, namely the one third that became rebellious against God, following the same model of uh, the one third of the angels following the dragon. So when you see in the fifth trumpet that they are not allowed to harm the green stuff, that's a representation of God's people, I believe. And it's paralleled by the expression, 
but only those that do not have the seal of uh, God on their foreheads. Let me show you from the text. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So you have those that do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In opposition to them are those that are called grass, green thing, or tree. So therefore, they are those that do have the seal of God on their forehead. I hope that makes sense from the text. That's good. That's a good question. I don't have the verse here, but I will read it straight from the Bible. Okay. Revelation 9, 5. They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. That's the verse that I was speaking about earlier, that the scorpions or the scorpion-like demons, demonic forces, were not supposed to kill. They were supposed to only torment. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I've never been struck by a scorpion. <laughs> but what I'm hearing and what I'm reading is that uh, quite often if the scorpion um, strikes <laughs> you, then you will not die. But the pain is unbearable. Because later on, the description speaks about a situation where they want to die, but they can't. So you want to die. That's how bad it is. Again, I don't know what that means in practical terms, but that's the picture here. So the question is, what about the 150? The five months. The, uh, one, yeah, five months, which is 150 days and years as a prophetic time. Well, there are many speculations on this. Some people see some sort of uh, prophetic period of time that applies to the Turks, to the Ottoman Empire again. I don't see that in the full picture. What I see in the Bible, possible application for the 150 days is something that has to do with the um, flood. In the flood, the waters were rising for 150 days. It can be a parallel that somehow ties into that. I looked at many different kind of explanations. I haven't found anything that would satisfy my uh, exigence at this point, but I see a valid possibility in the picture of the flood because the picture of the flood is about justice. 150 days, five months, five times three is 150 days. But again, I'm not positive. If it's historical years that correspond to those days, or it's to be taken as it is, hard to say for me. But it is a difficult time where um, those that don't have the seal of God on their foreheads are tormented by those demonic forces for that certain amount of time, whatever that entails. That's a good question. That same question can be asked with regard to the seals and the churches as well. So the question is, do we have a certain chronological time frame that we can indicate when it comes to the first church, second church, third church, and then first seal, second seal, third seal, and so on, and then first trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet? 
The answer is yes. But then we have to also see it's very hard to indicate precisely. There are commentators that would tell you, for instance, um, from this point to this is, uh, say, 34 when uh, Stephen was stoned to 100. Then from here to um, 313 and so on and so forth. I would not go with those very precise delimitations because it can give to some people the impression we really know everything. I believe we can explain the book of Revelation without relying on uh, numbers that we come up with. I would always use these time periods like 1 to 60, 42, um, to 300. Why? Because I have them in the Bible. But other than that, I'm uh, somewhat reluctant to be exacting. I believe it's important for us as Seventh-day Adventists to be able to explain the Bible from the Bible. If you want to see invasion, for instance, in the text you can see invasion. That the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Once you establish that the mountain, the burning mountain is indeed Babylon. And then its correspondent in the New Testament, which is Rome, and I have Bible verse for that. So it's not a fictional identification, right? Because Peter clearly identifies in 1 Peter chapter 5, Babylon. And at that time, there was no place on earth called Babylon, but Rome. In biblical jargon, and in the jargon of the first Christians in the first century, Babylon was Rome. So once you establish that here you are speaking about Rome, Rome is the great mountain burning, thrown in the sea, and then you identify the sea as being the sea of the nations, then you can explain that the barbarian tribes or invasions destroyed and sacked Rome, and that's how Rome came to an end. So there you can have some sort of invasion. <laughs> that's a very good question. What are the 24 elders doing throughout the seven trumpets? I don't know exactly, but at the end of them, they pop up. Let me, let me show where they pop up. Chapter 11, yes. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. So there they pop up again and they say, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and started to reign. That's what we know about them at the end, like here. But don't forget that the first time we see them in the book of Revelation is right here at the beginning, before the seven seals even start being open. And what they do is they similarly, like here in uh, 16, the 24 elders sit before God in their thrones or on their thrones or around the throne. There is a series of events in the Bible in which you have the same picture. God sitting on the throne, surrounded by some others. One is Job chapters 1 and 2. Then you have Daniel chapters 7, 8, 9, that whole picture there. 
Then you have uh, some other smaller pictures in some of the books of the prophets. And you have the book of Revelation. What I understand from the full picture, from the uh, composite picture, is that the 24 elders are involved in the justice process that God carries out. Applied to the history of the seven trumpets, if indeed the seven trumpets are manifestations of preliminary or partial justice interventions of God against the enemies of God's people, then somehow the 24 elders are involved. How do I know? Well, if you go to chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So the 24 elders have bowls full of incense, if indeed incense is the merits of Jesus Christ obtained at the cross, which is, I think, proved in chapter 8, right at the beginning when the angel receives incense at the altar of, altar of sacrifice. If that interpretation is correct, then the 24 elders holding incense in the bowl to me suggests that whenever God wants to intervene with justice on behalf of his people and against the enemies of his people, somehow the 24 elders are involved in that justice process, maybe deciding or being part of the decision of how much incense from the bowl should be mixed in that justice manifestation that God does. So if you remember last time we were speaking about the 24 elders and I was uh, presenting the view according to which the 24 elders are representatives of the unfallen worlds and they are involved in the government process of God. That's why they are sitting on thrones around the heavenly throne of the Father. Okay, so then that can mean that among them there may be humans as well. Not really. Because if in the book of Job, when you have the same kind of scene and uh, Satan appears, Satan masquerades as being the representative of planet Earth, then he seems to be the one that assumes the authority to represent the earth that would rightly be represented by Adam and Eve had they not sold the earth to the devil. So if that is correct, then in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ overcomes the devil, the one that masquerades as the representative of the earth, and he holds the place of Adam and Eve until the reestablishment of everything with the recreation of everything. So then I don't see how humans can be involved in that group. So from the cross to the second coming, when he starts reigning. Yes, so the 24 elders say, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and started to reign, okay? So at this time, Jesus Christ starts reigning, although he had received authority right after the cross, on earth and in heaven. 
But here he starts reigning. But at this point here, the new creation has not been established yet. So if you think logically, I think when the new creation happens, which is at the end of the book of Revelation in chapters 21, 22, that's the time when Jesus Christ, the one that reigns, gives that part back to whom it belonged, to whom it belonged. Yeah, okay, good question. So we have a few human beings that we know are in heaven. One is Enoch. That's probably the first, well, the first we know of. Then we have uh, Elijah. Well, Moses, Moses and Elijah. We don't know exactly in what order, though. We know Moses died before Elijah. We don't know when Moses was resurrected. OK, so we can count three people from the Bible that we know should be in heaven. Are they the only humans that are in heaven? You are saying no because you know or because you don't know? Sorry? And then you have Christ as well as, as uh, the incarnate God. True, but those humans that are resurrected at the resurrection of Christ are in heaven from that point on. These other three that I mentioned uh, were there before. How do I know that even Moses were there? Because when he appeared on the mountain, he was coming from heaven. Otherwise, Jesus would have called him from the dead, and that would be a little shady on him. You understand the process? So, so up to that point where some of those that are resurrected at Jesus Christ's resurrection and are taken to heaven as the trophy, and you can look up uh, Ephesians chapter 4, I think verse 8, where he says that he took captives or captivity captive or captives into captivity, depending on how it's translated. So those have been taken to heaven as a trophy or a proof or a token that Jesus overcame death for himself and not only for himself, but also for us. So they are the first fruit represented also in the sanctuary service. Up to that point, according to what we know, there are three people. So my question was, uh, are only three people? And some said no. And I was curious based on what they said no. Because in my opinion, the right answer to that is we don't know, which is somewhat different, right? Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. <laughs> absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. We don't know. That's the correct answer. What we know, however, based on what I presented last time, is that the 24 elders are there around the throne before those that were resurrected at Jesus Christ's resurrection were taken to heaven. And I believe the 24 elders are the same that are also pictured as messengers or watchers in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, for instance, and also the following chapters, and the same that appears in uh, the book of Job. I believe it's the same kind of setting. In other words, God's government is a shared government. When God acts, especially when he acts in just, justice, he doesn't act on his own only. He involves intelligent beings from the universe into his justice process, which I believe is remarkable. He's not a dictator. I think that speaks about his character, especially in the great conflict, great controversy scheme. And God is not one, is three in one. 
okay? You have plurality there already, but you also have in his government, you have uh, the 24 elders sharing some sort of responsibilities in his way of ruling the whole universe. Very good question. So the question is about UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Now, the first question is whether they really exist or not, because there is so much uh, debate, scientific and pseudo-scientific debate with regard to that. Nevertheless, I believe biblically, we can say that there are aliens. Aliens do exist, meaning there are intelligent beings outside of the realm of what we know as the realm of intelligent beings, planet Earth. And if that is true, I don't know to what extent, to what degree they can be involved and uh, can come and uh, do um, overflights or surveillance of planet Earth. But even the angels, the angels, those that are not just human messengers, because in the Bible you have angels as human messengers and angels as beyond the realm of humans, beings that come from the outside. If Paul says they are serving or ministering spirits, then they are aliens in a certain sense. I know it's weird to hear this word in this context, but I'm, I'm just trying to expand that that is possible. Now, if good angels are involved in human life, and I believe they are, Paul even says that some have given them food to eat. Mm -hmm. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. yeah, some uh, practiced hospitality and not knowing they gave food, entertained the uh, angels. So that's, that's a pretty potent evidence that some intelligent beings from the outside are involved. All the more so based on um, Ephesians chapter 6, for instance, but even chapter 1 and 2, plenty of uh, expressions that speak about the powers or the authorities or the principalities of the enemy in the air or of the air. So then UFOs can uh, be... Uh, demonic manifestations, to fool, to mislead, to mess up people's mind. But can we say good, intelligent beings cannot take that shape? I don't know. Let's take this question and we are done, okay? Where are we, where are we in uh, the history outline of the seven trumpets? And by the same question, seven seals and seven churches. Well, the, the best way of answering that is that we are, we are here. Okay. We certainly passed this landmark, the 2300 landmark. The three angels are flying. Okay. And uh, it is fulfilled what the angel told John, you have to prophesy again. So we are here somewhere. Where exactly? If we put here a finish point, I suspect, based on some biblical evidence, we are closer to this point here than to this point here. If that uh, helps. Without, without uh, throwing... Uh, numbers and uh, all kind of uh, misleading things there. Thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, a joy for me to uh, spend some time in the book of Revelation. Next. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your spirit guiding our hearts and minds. Yes, there are things that we know. There are things that we do not know. But uh, we would like to learn more and deepen our understanding so we can uh, see clarity. And in everything, in our history and the history of Christianity, we can see you. Thank you in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.